is the biggest fighter in the history of the sport. Um, my, um, if you don't believe it, um, just check the, check the cash register. Wow, this is it. This is the biggest fight in history. When the fight's on that night, nearly everybody around the world will be watching it. So the two yeah. best boxers, man, coming, coming fist to fist. It's got to be the biggest fight of all time, man. It really is the classic one of the, the stylist versus the animal. Why he's so fused. Tyson's already a god. Lois wants to be, and the only person who can define that for Lois is Tyson. It's 25 years since Elvis died, and his hometown Memphis is about to crown a new king. The rumble in the jungle caused a stir in the 70s, but the bloody on the muddy is an even bigger prospect. The most controversial and brutal heavyweight of our generation, Iron Mike Tyson. The underdog is taking on squeaky clean British world heavyweight champion and odds-on favorite Lennox Lewis. Valued at a cool $120 million, the Dixieland Ruck is the richest boxing event of all time. But it ain't just about money. This grudge match decides who's the heavyweight daddy of our time. It's gonna get rough. It's gonna get tough. Lennox Lewis is a great world champion. He wants to be known and remembered as being a legend. They're fighting for their pride, they're fighting for their dignity, and they're fighting to, you know what I mean, be heavyweight champion of the world. If Lennox didn't take this fight, he would always be known as the person who avoided Mike Tyson. He's just a street fighter and you're a knockout man. Mm. And Lennox is a professional fighter, so... Yeah, I'll knock out man. What will knock out a man, so it's, this is a good fight. They're two different people, you know. Lennox is cool, he's confident about himself, you know, he's a true sportsman, you know. And on the other hand, you've got this wild man. What would Tyson be if he wasn't a fight? Tyson would be a cannibal. Are you afraid of the monster? Once the king of the ring, Mike Tyson was the greatest heavyweight world champion since Muhammad Ali. But the Iron Man's reputation is in meltdown. He's done time for rape and road rage, and a couple of years ago, he disgraced himself again, biting through the flesh of an opponent's ear. Unsurprisingly, there are rumors that he's one glove short of a pair. He's now become a professional victim, as far as I'm concerned. He blames everybody for his problems, but his problems all emanate from himself and the way he behaves. You don't know what side of the bed he gets out of. You don't know what he's going to do next. Um, recent press conference, you've heard some of the profanities that he, he screamed at people, and uh, he doesn't care whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. I normally don't do interviews with women unless I fornicate with them. Are you afraid of the booty monster? So you shouldn't talk anymore. I think the average person believes that I'm a nut and I deserve whatever happened to me. That's what I believe. There's always a goody and a baddie. Tyson just happens to be a genuine baddie. Mike is no different from you. He's no different from me. He's just a man. And he is most certainly not mad. Are you afraid of the booty monster? Boxing people that know him better than us are saying that, you know, is he mentally disturbed? He is foul-mouthed, you know, ranting and raving, and he can be a horrible human being. So every now and then I kick your <laughs> stomp on you and put some kind of pain, inflict some kind of pain on you because you deserve to feel the pain, somewhat of the pain that I feel. I don't think he's off his head. I, you know, he may be looking for an excuse to, to not even fight me. Tyson's roller coaster life has been played out in front of the world's media, but Lennox Lewis keeps himself to himself. He's cool, calm, and collected. The only bites coming from his mouth are tailor-made for the press. He's got such a wall around him. There's so many walls to peel off before you get to know the man. I feel good, relaxed, uh, just focused. Uh, thinking about the fight, what I want to do in the, in the ring. Uh, running the fight through my head with, of course, me winning. All his sound bites, all the things he says to the press, 
are quite rehearsed. Lewis transfers the discipline of his private life into his professional career. While he's in training, he abstains from the pleasures of the flesh for three pre-fight months. Why is it wrong for you to have sex before a fight? Uh, it depends. It depends on the person. You know, some, some people it gives, gives us great strength to. Some people it robs them of energy. So it depends on what kind of person you are. Are you fighting tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's <laughs> up to him, innit? If you don't want to have sex three months before the fight, then good luck to him, you understand? If it was me, if I was having a big fight, I'm having sex the night before, you know, like, bitch. It's my mm. night. <laughs> <laughs> when I was boxing, I used to have um, a bonk in the changing room, but I never ever won a lot, so it didn't matter a difference. Lennox now, Lennox ain't married. So Lennox meets a woman and she starts acting up. Oh, Lennox, you know, you never called me yesterday. Hick! Woman, I'm fighting Tyson. I ain't got time to be worried about calling you. Just understand. No, well, my last man used to call me all the time, yeah? And I know that you think you're Lennox Lewis, yeah? But you better just call me, yeah? That's what I'm saying, yeah? You told me 7 o'clock. 5 past 7. It's 5 past 7. Why you never call me at 5 past 7? You don't need a mad chick on your head when you're going to fight Tyson. That woman will get you knocked the hell out. <laughs> Women can bring problems to the table and keeping away from sex and focusing what you've got to do, like if the later rounds come, oh, only if I didn't have that last night or the two weeks ago, that's why I just forget all that and concentrate on the job in hand. A lot of people do that. That's why they go to training camps, you know what I mean? They even sleep with their boxing gloves on at night time so they don't get tempted <laughs> with the wrist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Boxers will try just about anything to get the upper hand on opponents. And former world champion Hasim Rachman got right under Lennox's skin when he cast doubt on his sexual preferences. When the two met to kiss and make up on telly, it was handbags at ten paces. Did he question your sexuality? Yeah, he, he, he said, uh, why are you starting that gay sh uh, stuff? I'm saying, I'm not gay. Why are you calling me gay? He said he's not calling me gay. So I don't understand that. When he, I don't know why he was so offended. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent woman's man, so don't even play that. If, if you're worried about that, bring, bring your sister, bring anyone. No, 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 no. If I can anger you, then I will conquer you. If you can make your opponent hate you, nine times out of ten you'll beat him. That's a fact. I had first-hand experience. What you mean? I just said it. What you want me to say? say what you want me to say? Same thing like, like what? Like what? Like what? Anything what you want me to say? He ain't gay. I don't think he's gay whatsoever. Just rumours. He's been around for years. We get rumours about us. Mm. It's not true. I, I don't even want to talk about his sex life because yeah. on the street now you won't want to know what he's what people are saying about him. So mm. forget his sex life because I'm not. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> been speculation about Lennox's sexuality. Let's look at the sort of pointers to that. I mean, he's very close to his mother. You don't see many girlfriends about. He doesn't talk overtly about who he fancies, which woman turns him on and whatever. And of course, there's been a lot of slanging uh, by Hassie Mackman and Mike Tyson, which question his sexuality. And I think, you know, Lennox has took it on the chin because it's a very sort of serious allegation in this sport. If you are not that way, it's very offensive. And if you are, but you are trying to cover it up, it's extremely offensive. You know, a homosexual should have the right to come out in their own time. <laughs> saying it's, it's true or it's false or whatever, but imagine Lennox Lewis came out and said, you know what, this is me, the first heavyweight champion in the world to proclaim his sexuality, that he was gay, or he was bisexual, or whatever. You know what I mean? Imagine that. What a story that would make. Personally, I don't think that Lennox is gay. That's my personal opinion. But if he was, Who's gonna say it to him? This is Lennox Lewis. There's some gay brothers you can go up and go, you're gay, and they're like, oh, stop it. Lennox will slap the shit out of you. You, you go up to Lennox and say, you're gay, and see what happens. Lennox is the toughest gay man I've ever seen, so if he's gay, good for him. I don't care. If you 
definitely want to get up someone's nose, then it's been made very public what actually does. So the gay, the gay thing came out, you know? But um, I don't think so personally, no. no. Plus I've seen him in a dress and it's not all that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Little blue off the shoulder number. No one's ever questioned which side of the street Mike Tyson walks on. He's got quite a reputation with the ladies, and the tabloid press reckon he's got a stash of hundreds of home movies starring the Iron Man himself and his various conquests. I can see what other women would like about Tyson. They, a lot of women probably like a bit of rough. A lot of women probably see his money, which I don't agree with, mm. but I'm sure he has a lot of women that flutter around him because he's got a lot of money in his bank. They're like big muscular sad. men. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And they like a bit of risque, and there's a lot of gold diggers out there, and it's as simple as that. Top supermodels don't tend to have too much trouble pulling top sportsmen. They mix in the same social circles. When Naomi Campbell told her half-brother Richard Blackwood, who she was dating, he was ready to welcome the baddest man on the planet into the bosom of his family. She came into my bedroom and we sat down on the bed and like, I remember I used to talk to her about her fame and how, you know, what, what's happening for her now, because this is when she started to blow up as a supermodel. And she goes, Richard, I'm going out with somebody famous. So I said, who are you going out with? Right, and I remember she was sitting on my right, and she goes, I'm going out with Mike Tyson. I went, shut up. Mike Tyson, you ain't going out with Mike Tyson, because I still didn't know how famous she was, especially in the States. She goes, I'm going out with Mike Tyson. And she goes, call your dad. And I called my dad out. I goes, who's she going out with? And he laughed. He goes, she's going out with Mike Tyson. And I was like, now, if Tyson was to just say something disrespectful, how can I, your brother, step up and slap Mike Tyson? I mean, what could I say to Mike Tyson? I was um, a reporter um, during the time when he came over to fight Julius Fans, and I was in the hotel where he was training. And I can remember him walking towards me, his entourage, as he was going into the gym. And, you know, it's so silly, my heart started pounding. Not because I fancied this guy, but, but here coming towards me was this enigma. And you know what's really strange? He came over to me, shook my hand, and he said, don't be afraid. Coming up. What if he isn't the villain that you've been told that he is? What if he isn't? I mean, he was a powerful brother. <laughs> People are just getting me. <laughs> just get a check. <laughs> you know? and I wish I could kill him now. When I think about him, I don't think anything positive or nice about him. He's a cartoon character to me, uh, especially being uh, things he's been doing, things he's been saying, you know. But uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach him a lesson. I'm gonna discipline him. But he'll pay for that with his help. <laughs> Don't expect to see a display of good manners when Lewis and Tyson finally go toe to toe. They're locked away, working themselves into a frenzy of mutual hate. When you go in the ring, right? The fact is, yeah, that's the enemy, isn't it? So you've got to not, you can't like your enemy. I hate talking like it, but you've got to want to kill them. You've got to. You're Tyson has that vengeance. Hatred is the wrong word. They've been in love with each other for the last six months when the fight was made. Being in love means that you think about the person 90% of the day. That's all they've been doing. They're consumed with each other. It's a thin line between love and hate, and when Lennox Lewis meets Tyson in Memphis, he'll be facing a man with an awesome reputation for inflicting proper pain. The, the little bit of edge that Tyson has is he would actually be doing it for, yes, the professional boxing reasons, I want to win, and... He's also got a personal agenda that he just likes hurting people. But you cannot teach someone to have venom in their blood. He's born with it. Mike Tyson grew up in Brooklyn, New York, hanging out with his homeboys. It was tough ghetto living, and learning to fight was the best education a boy could get. He started hanging out with me and my brothers and them. And we told him he's gonna have to fight back. He's gonna hang out with us. You know, so all of a sudden he just started, he started fighting back. The first guy that started hitting him. That's when he started fighting back. You know what I'm saying? When he, when he won the fight, then he, from there, he was in. He was in. You know? And he's been fighting ever since, since he was 13. Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. 
Tyson's dad had 21 children and Mike hardly knew him. As a boy, Tyson lived with his mum and helped supplement the family income by using his quick wit and aggression, getting into some petty crime which led to a stint at reform school. But Tyson's bad luck was about to change. A warder introduced Mike to legendary boxing manager Custom Arto, who immediately saw the potential of his new raw recruit. He adopted Mike and took him out of the ghetto to his country boxing stable. It was the closest Tyson ever came to having a normal family. Cus used to say, I've got one here, you know he will be world champion. Well, you expect that from all managers, but Cus understood his boxing. He wasn't just a manager for the money. Custom Arto, he was like a doctor, he was like a father, he was like a, a psychologist to him and the philosophies that um, Customado had in his head. He'd sit down with him and he'd just vision like a prophet. But the father figure, D'Amato, was old and frail, and he died just before Tyson won his first World Heavyweight Championship. Unlike Tyson, Lennox Lewis has his mother's unstinting support. She's always by his side. Lennox is just jobbing. Doing the job, and then when he go like this, it's just a half a cut. I never liked boxing until he started boxing. And I like to watch him. He's good in the ring. Good performance. He's a natural. My dad needs to come away and train with me, so it's nice to have someone in your family, your own flesh, watching over you. And I think it's a great thing having um, his mum there, and she's been there from day dot. It's nice to see a big man that close to his mom. I'm proud of it. I don't care what anyone says, you know? That's a good thing in my book. Lennox Lewis is, technically speaking, a proper cockney. Born in the East End of London, like Tyson, Lennox didn't really know his dad. The young Lennox lived with his Jamaican mum. But Violet struggled to make ends meet. She moved to Canada in search of golden pavements, leaving her two sons behind in London with family. Lennox got a reputation as a rowdy, rebellious boy and he got expelled from primary school in East Ham after punching his fist through the door of the headmaster's office. Lewis ended up in a couple of council-run boarding schools for difficult kids, but after a few years getting settled, his mum brought 12-year-old Lennox out to Ontario, where he swapped the inner city life of the East End for a provincial small town called Kitchener. I first met Lennox about 25 years ago. He came into the gym with uh, a couple of buddies to learn uh, how to fight because he, he was planning a schoolyard fight. So I basically told him that uh, he came to learn how to fight, get out of my gym and don't come back. But if you want to be a boxer, he came to the right place. Because Lennox had moved out to Canada, he was allowed to box under the Maple Leaf flag at the 1988 Olympics. He won gold in the heavyweight division and just as importantly, managed to get through the tournament with his disco diva moustache intact. He was even more delighted when he got the chance to break into big-time boxing as a professional back home in Britain. He signed with me in 1989, and I actually sold him on the pitch of Frank Bruno. I said to him, look, Frank Bruno was, had just lost to Mike Tyson. He was an undoubted hero in Britain because he fought for the world title twice at some and lost both times. And everyone admired him in Britain. And, you know, I said to Lance Lewis, can't just imagine what you would be if you win the world title. But what I didn't realize was that he didn't have the personality or the magnetic draw. Britain was longing for its first undisputed heavyweight champion of the 20th century. But even though Lewis won it in 1999, he still finds it hard to convince people which flag he's fighting for. Sometimes I get quite annoyed with him when I watch the telly because he sort of goes from being American to English. And I think, you know, what are you doing? You know, if he's talking to an American reporter, he's American. And they have that sort of Canadian twang. And when he talks to an English reporter, he's, you know, he's respectable Mr. English. He's the world champion. And, you know, it, be it Jamaicans that want to claim him because of his parentage, then fine. If it's Canadians because he had a little stint in Canada, then fine. And UK, I think it's, I think he's our, as in the world champion. He's sort of come back to England. People haven't took him as, as a true Brit 
which I know annoys him. You know, he's very patriotic and the Union Jack's always swirling around somewhere. But he's, you know, he's, he's different. He, he doesn't come across as one of the boys like a Frank Bruno does. It took a long time for British people to generally say he's one of ours, you know. They did it immediately with Frank Bruno, who was also born in London of Jamaican parentage. He's born in Britain, he's representing Britain, so he's British, man. You ain't gonna represent That's Britain right, if you're yeah, not yeah. British, man, so. Lennox's team made every effort to convince us that the man with the twang is actually a true Brit. A PR stunt had some success when his manager, Frank Maloney, got himself a Union Jack suit. The suit was such a hit, you know, everyone in Britain started uh, recognising the suit in Lennox Lewis, and then you started noticing people in the audience actually wearing the suit. I mean, the first Holyfield fight, there was 12 people wearing Union Jack suits, and it just bonded them all behind Lennox Lewis. While Lewis was sorting out his nationality and winning the ultimate amateur prize at the Olympics, Mike Tyson was living the all-American dream. In 1986, he became an overnight star when at just 20, he was crowned the youngest ever professional world heavyweight champion. Tyson once laughed. I remember he beat this guy. He goes, yeah, I had him in the corner, and he was doing his thing. He started to cry, like, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. And I thought, you little punk. And I hit him with the uppercut. He's like, ha it's quite funny. And I thought, this guy loves to murder people. I mean, he was a powerful brother. <laughs> people are just getting me. <laughs> just get the check. <laughs> you know? There's a lot of them was scared. You could, Tyson could smell the fear. <laughs> Tyson took the world by storm in the mid-80s, but his private life started going to pieces. He broke his wrist in a street brawl with a former opponent, and he crashed his beamer into a tree. The Iron Man had a seven-month marriage to TV star Robin Givens, which ended soon after she told America Tyson was less than the perfect husband. He's got a side to him that's scary. Michael is intimidating to say the least. After their divorce, Tyson went into free fall. He lost his heavyweight crown to no hoper James Buster Douglas, and then a beauty queen, Desiree Washington, accused him of rape. Tyson was given a heavyweight six-year jail term. He became a Muslim in prison, but whilst he found comfort in Islam, the rest of the world shunned him. Only his most stalwart supporters stood by him. Chris Eubank visited Mike Tyson 10 times. He has been convicted of a crime he says he believes he didn't commit. What if he isn't the villain that you've been told that he is? What if he isn't? Okay, imagine if he has been set up, because that's what he says. He says he's been set up. Tyson served another stretch in jail for road rage, but it was his ring rage attack on Evander Holyfield that fueled the speculation that Iron Mike was losing his marbles. Tyson got the cannibalistic munchies and bit a chunk out of his opponent's ear. I was about four rows back. I could see it all, what had happened. He, you know, he tried the first time, then he done it a second time, and it was outrageous, really, you know, and that's not what boxing's all about. Boxing's about two gladiators. Holyfield was sneakily biting him, you know what I mean, elbowing him, treading on his toes and things like that, and he got frustrated with it, and he just um, got out there and just beat him. As much as we understand he's a street fighter and he's been through certain issues in his life... The things you don't do there's, is... there's no excuse for what he done. It's as simple as that. Feel. Whether people think it's right or not, there's no excuse. Uh, he knew he was losing. He found the Holyfield was beating him with a boxing skill and he just could not deal with it. And that's why I think that he bit his ear because he knew he was going to lose and he wanted to get disqualified. Deep down inside of all that craziness of biting and wild and going off the rails, he's got a good, good, good heart and a nice person. He's a sort of like guy will give you his car. If he had a watch on like that watch, oh, I like that watch, he would give you the watch, stupidly give you out of just a nice, nice guy, you know what I mean? Like pe pe in New York, you know, at Christmas times and things like that. He goes down to the ghettos and gives them chickens and, you know, the poor people and whatever. People don't really see that sort of, like, different things, but he's got, a, he's got a good heart. What you see with Mike Tyson is what you get. It's a raw, undiluted form of humanity. Whether you like Mike Tyson or not, you know, you want to be near him. I mean, let's face it, 
he is the reason why this fight is so big. No, no offense to Lox Lewis, fantastic champion though he has been and will be. It's Mike Tyson people are coming to watch. They are engrossed in him. People that support Tyson like the fact that he's just real. I understand where you're coming from because at the end of the day, it's a profession. Yes. So you should go in there and be a professional. Yes. Unfortunately, he's not perfect. He's a human being and people make mistakes. That's and he's confused and he's stuck in the middle he's between confused. professionalism and where he comes from. He's real. He is a villain. Um, he is uh, an outcast. But he's representing to somebody. Tyson had a fight planned in the UK a couple of years back, but because of his rape conviction, there was a real to-do about letting him into the country. Opinion was split, because to some people, Iron Mike is still a hero. When he did finally arrive, he went walkabout in Brixton, South London, and got a rapturous reception. They said that you didn't want me here, right? You want me here? Oh, my After Brixton, Mike headed up west to swanky Bond Street for the type of shopping spree most of us can only dream of. But he never paid his bill at top-notch Graf Jewelers. And his boxing promoter, Frank Warren, got 400 grand's worth of hassle from the posh rock shop. I've been all over the world, and I've bought diamonds all over the world, and I'm truly impressed here. I must say one thing. Mike's got a great knowledge of diamonds. He's not just uh, a boxing man. He might tie some bought some jewelry in London. The bill wasn't paid, and eventually he settled the bill. That was his bill. And he set, and Mike Tyson settled that bill. Just a misunderstanding. Not from me, it wasn't. Champion boxers aren't short of a few, Bob. Tyson and Lewis have earned more money than most of us could if we lived our lives over and over. And Lewis drove past me in a Bentley convertible not too long ago. I don't think he's paying that off on finance. Some people get big flash cars, some people get big flash houses. I used to be wearing big bracelets and things like that, but you always have it there for a rainy day. As four mop-haired geezers from Scouseland once said, money can't buy you love. But with champion boxers, it attracts hangers-on like bees to the honeypot. Their entourages are heavyweight. It's amazing boxers. They, they walk into a room and they fill a room automatically so quickly. I remember um, asking Lennox why he needed such a big entourage. And he said, Trish in his Canadian accent, the twang. He said, um, one man looks after my fuel, you know, looks after my food. He said, uh, one man looks after, you know, the, the body work, the, the, the paint work, and wh how I look on the outside. And I said, Lennox? He said, yeah. I said, can I look after your gear stick? <laughs> oh, we both laughed that day. Everybody is in the ring, and then you see, like, four or five men standing behind, going, well done, man, well done, well done. Who is he? We don't, we've never seen him before. And he's got the sunglasses, yes, man, yes, man. And going, my friend, my All of them, and then the thing is, it's a free for all. Some guys like to hear, oh, champ, 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 champ. You know, that's not good for me. You know, that gives you, to me, that would give me a full sense of security. I had people around me, I, just, I, I didn't know half of them, but then I'd get them free clubs and I was all hanging out all the time after, after fight parties. And, and some of them you think that you're your friends, they're not your friends, they're just around you for what they can get. As well as a cuts man and all the other boxing guys a heavyweight requires, Tyson will use members of his entourage to make sure their man wins. Tyson uses some of his entourage as, as weapons, like crocodile. Now he's fired Crocodile, but I think Crocodile may be back there by the time the fight happens. He's the greatest fighter of all ever! We will prove it Saturday night! But what did Crocodile do for him? As much as he was, people looked at him, the outsiders look at him and say, oh, he's a, he's a nut, you know, he's loud and we, want, we don't want him around it. He would actually get to some fighters. Boxing is, is probably 10% physical and 90% mental. And a, a lot of the attitude that comes in is the old bully attitude. You know, if you can frighten, if you can frighten the guy, before the fight, if you can get him so scared, the fight's easy. And Mike Tyson relies on that a lot. People have been waiting for the Lewis-Tyson fight for the last five years. 
but in New York, in January, Tyson jeopardized the bout when he lost his rag at a press conference, dubbed the grapple in the apple. You know, Tyson came out into the podium, Lewis came out to the podium, they were standing there face to face, and uh, suddenly Tyson stepped off his podium, threw off his beret, and uh, got right in front of Lewis, threw a left hook at the, at the bodyguard, and then all hell broke loose. After about five minutes, uh, Tyson came out of the melee and he starts making threatening gestures and uh, we were all repulsed, really. And I just yelled and put my hands up and I yelled, boo, you know, and Tyson immediately turned around and saw me say it. And uh, he kept watching me and watching me and I was still bothered by what he did and I, yelled, I did it again and I yelled, put him in a straight jacket and he was still looking at me. He, he just totally disgraced the sport of boxing right there. You can't touch me, you're not man enough. I eat your ass on a lot, bitch. According to Lewis, there were telltale bite marks on his legs. It's like I'm just watching a, a dog barking through a fence. Mike Tyson bit me. He, all he did was was help me prepare for him because I don't like getting bit. And you could say he draw the he draw the first blood, and then I'm going to draw the second blood. <laughs> He let the dog out at the press conference, but hopefully he'll keep the dog in when we step into the ring. You don't know how much of it's publicity and how much is like, you know, but I mean now, you know, the, 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 you know, the press conferences now always end up in a punch-up. I mean, you know, with, how true is it? It was not staged. Look at it carefully. Understand it. <laughs> it has not been funny. I've been in boxing quite a long time. I've never seen someone stage a thing like that, you know what I mean, because boxing doesn't need to see two fighters going on like that and punching each other and crowds hangers on and all getting involved with it. You don't need that. The fight always starts long before the referee says box. And this is all part of the game. Intimidation or I'm standing my ground. Here I am, I'm going to be in your face. Intimidation. To put two heavyweights together, especially Tyson, you know he's gonna flip when you're standing up there looking at him. If he, oh, you want some? Yeah. And then they say, oh, this fight should. I think they said, oh, the fight should go on. Oh, he should ban title. You knew this was gonna happen. Coming up, I've had a few right handers in my time, you know, and it must be like a sledgehammer being slung at you by Jeff Capes or something. If he's that scared, if he's ding ding round one, he's that scared. He's ding ding. You're supposed to go forward, you ding ding and go under the ropes and run away. Tyson's never seen a boxer like Lennox Lewis. It's going to be a shock for him when he, when he steps in the ring with me. Let all the British fans know, um, especially um, my fans in Brixton, that um, I won't let them down and I'll give you the best that I have. The biggest fight in history is on. The boxers are locked away in their training camps in final preparation for the defining bout of their lives. Tyson's the underdog, but if he is back to his best, Lewis had better be prepared for all-out war. Tyson's a, you know what I mean, ding, ding, round one, out to get you. He's, a, he's not just a mauler, but he's a thinking mauler. He's very, very difficult to fight. Short guy, big arms, punches hard with every, with every punch that he throws, you know what I mean? Difficult for a big man to fight him. But Tyson has this thing, right, where he will, he'll get you against the ropes or in the corner, and he will go down like he's digging for coal, and he will come up, and you, it's like, it's like the, the signature punch, and it's just like, oh, and I remember you hit this guy, this guy's whole face turned upside down when he hit him, and from that blow, everybody knew, Every time Tyson goes down for dig for coal, call it a day. He, he will take you out with that blow. There's no doubt that Lennox packs a punch too. Taking a hit from a heavyweight champion is not something most of us put on our things to do list every day. I wouldn't like to be behind one of them punches if they no were connected to my head. No mm -hmm. dear. I've had a few right handers in my time, you know, and it must be like a, a sledgehammer being slung at you by Jeff Capes or something, you know? It's just uncomprehensible, I would say. You know, them big cranes with the big concrete things swinging in, into the house, you know, the demolition job. 
And for a man to humanly take them punch is incredible. I punched with four tons of pressure, and I fought at super middleweight, 168 pounds. These men are 30, 40 pounds heavier than I was, so they then have to be punching with twice the amount of pressure. And if you were to walk in to the arena, a second after I threw the punch, you would have said, well, he has to have hit him with a sledgehammer. They shake like that. They get to 10, you're out. Fun game, huh? <laughs> Boxers don't save their best punches for fight nights. They have to practice. And some of the more unlucky pugilists are brought into training camps as sparring fodder. But a few years back, a young cruiserweight from Tyneside totally disarmed Mike Tyson when he turned up for his ritual beating in Atlantic City. They were paying my fare to go out there. And I took a, a suitcase and a, a hold all with my head guard and that on. I got to Atlantic City and my suitcase did not arrive at the airport. With my last 10 pound, I had to go down the Army Navy stores on the Atlantic City boardwalk. And get and all I could afford were some white plimsolls, a pair of white army navy shorts, and a white vest. So I turned up to fight the most feared, to spar with the most feared man in the planet, like a, like a milk bottle with some with some army navy plimsolls on. So I think he was quite surprised. I think I did all right the first year because he just he was laughing so much he couldn't hit me. It may come as something of a shock that Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson had already had a fight. They sparred together in the mid-80s, but Lennox hadn't done his homework and he wasn't prepared for a war. Lennox and he got along very well. They ran together and so on. But when the bell rang for the first round, everything changed. Mike suddenly relied on his basic instincts and became an animal, and uh, Lennox was not prepared for that. So the first round was kind of a disaster for Lennox. He had bloody nose and so on. He came to the corner and I cleaned him up and I said, look, we don't have to do this today. I said, we can leave it go for a few days or if you want to, we can go home. He said, oh no, I know what to do now. <laughs> so from there on, Lennox uh, started to use his ability and his brains and eventually got the handle make pretty easily. Fight the power! The two boys born on the wrong side of the street have come a long way since their sparring days. Lewis and Tyson may both be products of the mean streets, but although their youths were lived in similar circumstance, they've taken very different routes to get to their bout in Memphis. But the supposed monster Tyson is undoubtedly the star of the show, and that grates on Lewis the gentleman. It's not gonna be a pretty fight, you know, it's gonna be rough in there, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a lot of pain. Lewis will be boxing, and Tyson will be hitting him absolutely anywhere he can and trying to break whatever bit it is he hits. When Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis go to war in Memphis, they'll be fighting for the right to claim their place in history as the don of this generation's heavyweights. It'll be a clash of styles, personality and size. At six foot five, Lewis towers six inches over his bull-like nemesis, and with arms as long as a tree trunk, Lewis can hold most men at a safe distance. But Tyson's never been afraid of big men. He grew up on the wrong side of the street where fending for yourself was second nature. The immediate problems that Mike Tyson faces is Lennox Lewis has so much size, so much size and so much reach. So he's gonna be looking up at his opponent and gonna be looking at big punches coming at him. So Mike Tyson has to move his head or them big jabs will be getting him right in the face. And then Lennox, as soon as he's got the jab, his best punch, the right hand. Oh, and it's, oh, it's all over. Mike Tyson must move his head. Shorter guys can give Lennox problems, especially Tyson. If he moves his head, avoids the jab, and then steps round, come up with shots, then he's out of the way, and then he's back up with shots. If he can do that, if Tyson can do that, if he can be back to the Tyson of old, lots of movement, good work with the jab, and then stepping round, then it's difficult for Lennox.
Lewis and Tyson have been locked away in their training camps for weeks. With so much prestige and money riding on the bout, their entourages are priming them for the biggest test of their careers. But the papers allege that Tyson's training's not gone well. They reckon that when he's not been sweating in the gym, he's been sunning himself on the beach smoking marijuana. I train just as hard, if not harder, than I party. I play hard and I, and I, I fight hard and I train hard and I balance it out. And I feel as if I'm 19 or 22 years old. I just feel wonderful. If Tyson's refound youth is just a drug-induced illusion, he's not going to have the physical or mental power to overcome Lewis whose Pennsylvanian training regime has gone perfectly. Lewis better be working. You best be training. He needs to be training. He needs to have the he stamina because be I really do think he, he needs has to, go to go the distance. He really does need to go the distance. Because Tyson doesn't really like to, he's not, he doesn't really like to do the distance, does he? He just likes to knock them out. When you've got Mike Tyson in the other corner, or when you've got Lennox Lewis, who's capable of knocking you out, who's a big, strong, tremendous athlete, when you've got people like that facing you, then that tests the bottle a bit. A boxer, you know, I mean, it always feels fair to fight in another boxer, but a boxer gets fit, he believes in himself, and once it's ding ding round one, if he's that scared, if he's ding ding round one, he's that scared, he's ding ding, he's supposed to go forward, he's ding ding and go under the ropes and run away, you know what I mean? When you go in there, it's um, eat or be eaten, you know what I mean? I'm the best there is, you know, I'm at top of the food chain, baby, and, you know, uh, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't do no good for me to go into the ring with any fear. In fact, Mike Tyson should be uh, fearful of me. If people said to me, what do you need to be a great fighter or something, the first thing I'd say is courage. If you're not brave, don't bother. You might be smart, you might be a hard puncher, you've got to be brave. A boxer can be as fit as a butcher's dog, but if Lewis and Tyson haven't got their heads in gear, they shouldn't bother turning up. I like to know that I've got a clear mind, because a lot of times, sometimes you go in a fight and your mind's elsewhere. So if you've, you've got a clear mind and you're just concentrating on the fight, everything else will follow. But if you ain't right upstairs, you can't train your body. By far the most important time in the preparation for the fight will be the hour or so the fighters spend in their dressing rooms. High tense atmosphere, coloured with knife in the um, dressing room. But the most important thing when you're under that sort of like pressure is to keep cool. Lennox is renowned as the coolest cat on the circuit. He lies down and has a kit before all of his bouts. Always uh, be relaxed before I step into the room because you don't want to be too tense uh, because that takes up a lot of energy. So I, I conserve all my energy and, and prepare myself before I step into the room. With his reputation for living on the edge, it's doubtful whether Tyson's dressing room will be quite so serene. Tyson? I think Tyson's probably slapping up someone or himself before you can go to the ring. But I think Tyson is a person that, before the fight, you don't even want to be in the room with him. Because he might just hurt you. In Tyson's dressing room, it'll be a degree of pandemonium, a degree of backslapping and shouting, and Tyson punching the living daylights out of lockers and, and walls. You can put your house on most people in the dressing rooms having a flutter on their man. But even though Lennox is the odds-on favorite, Tyson's known as a hard-hitting brute, so he's got to be in with a chance. Who's gonna win? The bookies. No, um, I should have, if I had to put my mortgage on it, it would be Tyson. I think Tyson will win the fight. But because the thing is, only because, only because I think he's hungry for it. I think he will try and battle Lewis from the beginning. And, and I can just see Lennox just, you know, keep hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. And I, the longer the fight goes on, the more frustrated Tyson will be. Who knows what he'll do? It's the biggest bout of the 21st century. Billions will be watching. It's good against evil. The bull versus the matador. The puncher facing up to the master technician. It's the heavyweight championship of the world. Lennox, he can hold a beating and he can give a beating, but Tyson, he can give a beating. <laughs> I hope that at the end of it they come out and they say, you know what, respect. Yeah, I respect you too. All hell's gonna break loose. <laughs> I'm wearing a head guard in, in my front row position commentating. Now, Lennox is a... Uh... 
I mean, to me, he's the best boxer. But I think a lot of people really want to see him, see him get down and dirty, really want to see him have a good war. If Lewis stands his ground, the fight goes in favour of Tyson. Tyson will put pressure on Lewis like you've never seen anyone put pressure on anyone before. It's going to be complete magic. <laughs>